January 10th, 1883, 4am. Hundreds of guests at the Newhall House Hotel were woken up by the sound of horse-drawn fire engines racing down the cobblestone streets of Old Milwaukee. Many of these guests were not yet aware that it was their hotel going up in flames. But as the flames grew and ripped through the elevator shaft and wide hallways, chaos broke out in the nationally known institution. Guests began searching for an escape, running to the hallways only to be driven back into their rooms by the roaring flames and billowing smoke. Desperate, they ran to their windows, trying to wave down help. They watched helplessly as firefighters struggled to get ladders to the windows because the building happened to be caught in a web of telephone and electrical wires. While one heroic fireman raced into a neighboring building and stretched a ladder across the alleyway six stories up to save the lives of six hotel maids, they could not save the lives of 40 other women who either jumped to their deaths or perished in the flames. In the end, 80 people lost their lives that night in the New Hall House. The event was nothing less than a tragedy, and the entire city of Milwaukee was in shock. As citizens grieved, they also began to look for answers. How could something like this happen? Did the institution know the building was a fire trap? Did they know their patrons had been putting their lives in danger every night? In the search for answers, one Milwaukee newspaper stood above the rest. This publication called for justice, dug deep into the situation, and earned the trust of Milwaukee readers when other papers had let them down. This pioneering paper was the Daily Journal, owned and edited by one-time Carroll College student Lucius W. Neiman. I'm Emily Gaggioli, and you're listening to A Pioneered History. Lucius Neiman had been living with his grandmother, Susan Capernal de la Mater, in Maguanago since he was two years old. But as the years went on, the boy itched to get away and work as a printer for a newspaper. When his grandmother would not give him permission to leave school, he ran away at the age of 12. Neiman made it all the way to Waukesha, where his grandmother soon found him. As grandmother de la Mater realized how serious her grandson was about his pursuit of printing, she called upon her friend Theron W. Height for help. At the time, Height was editor of the Waukesha Freeman and agreed to take care of young Neiman and begin teaching him about printing. And so Neiman's journey in news publication began. He worked as a typesetter for a few years at the Freeman before moving to Milwaukee to work in the composition room of the Sentinel. As he grew, so did his desires. Working to place the type for other reporters' stories was no longer enough for Neiman. He wanted to be out on the beat, reporting on the happenings of his community. However, the Sentinel editor would not accept Neiman as a reporter until he received further education. So at the age of 16, Lucius Neiman enrolled at Carroll College. At the time, Carroll was not actually functioning as a college, but always on a mission to provide education to the community from 1871 to 1893, Carroll College ran at the academy level, providing basic education for six to eight dollars a quarter, approximately $180 today. Neiman would have taken courses in mathematics, English language, literature, and history. However, his mind was not solely on his schoolwork. While at Carroll, Neiman began sending reports on Waukesha News back to the Sentinel, Reports so well-crafted that his editor finally relented and assigned Neiman to go to Madison and report on the 1875 session of the state legislature. Finally a reporter, Neiman left Carroll and began pioneering himself the career he had always dreamed of. For years, Neiman moved around the Midwest, working at different papers in various positions. He was known for prying into situation and exposing corruption. His reports were not flowery, long, and sensitive, like many news stories of the time, but informative and enlightening. Neiman was back at the Sentinel working as city editor when the paper was bought by politicians and bankers who wanted to turn the publication into a political mouthpiece. Neiman saw no way a biased paper could remain informative and enlightening, so he decided to leave the Sentinel for good. Wanting to create his ideal independent paper, Neiman bought 50% of the shares in a paper that was about to fail just 26 days after its first publication. When Neiman took the reins December 11, 1882, he established the mission for his new publication and published the following notice. The journal will be independent, aggressive, 
but always with due regard to the sanctities of private life. It will oppose every political machine and cabal, venal politicians of every stripe, every form of oppression, and at the same time, give all news for two cents. It will be the people's paper and will recognize that its field is Milwaukee and the state at large. Its columns will mirror vividly the life of the metropolis which gave it birth, the humor and pathos, the scenes and incidents which go to make up the day and the year. The paper was put to the test only a month later, as the ashes settled on the corner of Broadway and Michigan, where New Hall House once stood. While other papers, like the Sentinel, began absolving the owners and managers of responsibility, saying it could have happened in any hotel, the journal did not relent. They investigated the building, discovered horrifying examples of negligence. Fire exits were not marked, there was no alarm system, water hoses in the halls were so old they could not be unwound, heating and plumbing pipes had been installed without insulation, management had lied about the staff being trained in fire safety, and a cracked chimney had remained damaged even after inspectors asked for it to be fixed. The building was so notoriously dangerous, Milwaukee insurance companies refused to insure it. Yet Newhall management did nothing and said nothing. When a jury found George Scheller, proprietor of the Newhall bar, guilty of starting the fire and solely responsible for the 80 lives lost, Neiman and the journal did not hide their outrage. They felt Scheller was nothing more than a scapegoat, thrown into the spotlight to save the owners and managers from taking responsibility. The articles written by the journal caused such an uproar throughout the city that Scheller was brought back to trial and acquitted on the basis of a lack of evidence. Unfortunately, no one else was ever brought to trial, and the city was forced to move on. However, the unrelenting reporting of the journal earned the trust of the citizens and their circulation tripled in size. The Newhall tragedy reporting set the foundation for all reporting in the future. Though the paper would at times falter from their stark independence, they never blindly supported any politician or policy. If something seemed corrupt or destructive, the paper dug in and helped inform their audience. And the paper continued to help shape the world of journalism in the communities of Wisconsin for decades to come. In 1890, the journal did throw its full support behind Democratic candidate for governor, George W. Peck, in order to prevent the Republican Party from passing an education bill that would prevent any lessons from being taught in German. Neiman made the decision to temporarily forego their independence in order to fight against this attack on citizens' freedoms. At the same time, Neiman worked to report on a scandal of rampant fraud that had been taking place in the state treasury for over 40 years. The journal discovered that the state had been cheated out of nearly $35,000 a year. That would be about $1 million a year today. The reporting helped prompt the legislature and court system to take action. The journal also faced a greater challenge than most American papers during World War I. They not only had to report on the tragedies overseas, but the subterfuge taking place in their own city. As America entered the war against Germany, Many German papers in Milwaukee began using propaganda that called for loyalty to the German government. However, the reporting of the journal helped combat the pro-German tactics and kept the city in line with the rest of the country. Lucius Neiman guided the journal for five decades until his death on October 1st, 1935. But his influence in the world of journalism still lives on. Neiman's widow donated $1 million to Harvard University in 1937 to establish the Neiman Foundation for Journalism, an institution dedicated to lifting the standard of journalism for generations to come. They went on to establish several other programs, including the Neiman Lab, Neiman Reports, and the Neiman Watchdog, which worked to create accountability in journalism. Back in Milwaukee, Marquette University's Department of Journalism and Media Studies named their lead faculty position the Lucius W. Neiman Chair of Journalism. They have also gone on to sponsor and publish a series of lectures titled Social Responsibility of the News Press, which teach future and current journalists the importance of every aspect of their job. Lucius Neiman may have spent only a brief period at Carroll, but the pioneering spirit of Neiman's career should still be an inspiration to all students. This podcast was researched, written, and recorded by Emily Gaggioli. The story would not have been possible without the work of Will C. Conrad, 
Kathleen F. Wilson or Dale Wilson and their book, The Milwaukee Journal, The First 80 Years. Music by Emily Gaggioli.